Welcome to another edition of Inside Medicine. I am your host, Doug Geinzer, and we are here in the studio today with Dr. Carolyn Yuha, the Dean of the UNLV School of Nursing and the School of Allied Health. If you're new to us here on Inside Medicine, we broadcast live every Friday morning at 10 a.m. And if you would like to chat your questions into the studio, please feel free to do so. You could do so by going to VegasVideoNetwork.com slash live. Inside Medicine brings you the innovators, the educators, and those doing just great things here in the Las Vegas Valley to improve our quality of health. And obviously, healthcare education is a big matter with us today. Today, we've got with us Dr. Carolyn Yuha, the Dean of the UNLV School of Medicine and the yeah. Dean of the, I'm sorry, the Dean of the UNLV School of Nursing and the UNLV School of Allied Health. Dean, welcome to the studio. Thank you so much for inviting me. Yeah, we appreciate you being here. So let's do this. A lot of deans uh, are deans of a school for three, four, five, six, seven years. You've been the Dean of the UNLV School of Nursing for. 12 years. Yes, 12 years. I can't believe how fast the time has flown by. And along the way, you were duly appointed the Dean of the Allied Health. Yes, yeah, the School of Allied Health Sciences, which has been a great addition and added more uh, more opportunities for collaboration between the two schools. So Allied Health includes health physics, body imaging, nutrition, physical therapy, kinesiology, athletic training, and there's certainly a lot of overlap between that and nursing. That's see, you've got a lot going on over there. Is that common out there for there to be a dean between so many different colleges? Well, there are. I mean, around the country, you see this model in a number of places. Um, what makes it challenging here is that the two schools have different faculty governance structures. They're on different calendars. They have different faculty different types of faculty appointments. Mm -hmm. So I never know exactly what's happening. My husband will say to me something like, isn't this finals week? And I say, I don't know because it's finals <laughs> week in one school and not in the other school. Sure. So he says, well, gee, shouldn't the dean know that? And, you know, I so um, but it's 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 different. And it, it's interesting what happens. The it seems as though one week I'm having challenges in nursing and allied health is very quiet. Mm -hmm. And then the next week I'm having challenges in allied health and nursing is very quiet. It seems to work out. What happens when you have fires in both camps? Um, I delegate. I do a lot of delegation. I'm, I'm very fortunate in that I have some excellent leadership. And, and that makes a world of difference when you're trying to do a lot of things. So how do they come together? Because it seems like it's a natural thing. Obviously, when a patient gets sick and they go into a hospital or into a doctor's office, they're not just seeing a nurse. They're seeing a whole set of disciplinary folks, whether it's a physician, a nurse, a PT, an OT, a speech. And now it's all under one roof. How are you able to bring those programs together, and how does the student benefit from that? Yeah, so we, we uh, y you know, typically we educate in silos, and then we throw everybody out, as you've said. When they graduate, we throw them out and say, okay, now work together, to, now work together and play together well. So we have had some initiatives that we've had with uh, the School of Medicine, School of Dental Medicine, Social Work, where we do some education things together. And that's been very helpful. And physical therapy has been involved in that. But it's it's challenging because everyone has a curriculum they have to cover for their licensing exam. And we're all, we might be on different calendars and trying to get students together to do that. But that is a real challenge that we're working on. Yeah. So, you know, you oversee a lot of different programs over there. I want to spend some time talking about the uh, College of Nursing. And so UNLV has always had a very well-respected College of Nursing. It's been, it's been a good school. Yes. You came on board 12 years ago. And now it's getting, it's recognized as a great school. You've made a lot of changes over there. Tell us a little bit about those changes and well, why they were important. Well, first of all, a dean doesn't make changes by him or herself. I mean, this would only happen with the right faculty on the right, in the right positions. But, I mean, certainly we've, we've made a lot of changes. We offer, as you know, uh, we offer a bachelor's degree program. We offer a master's program, and, and the graduates become nurse educators or nurse practitioners. 
we offer a Ph.D. program, and we are the only Ph.D. program in the state. Ph.D. programs are focused on research, yeah. and that's, that's that focus. And then we offer a Doctor of Nursing Practice, which is focused on leadership and advanced practice. So um, with that realm of programs, you need a wide variety of faculty to cover them, and it can be quite complex. Um, but we, but uh, I'm not sure where I'm going with this now. Yeah, no. So <laughs> you, your, your, your master's program. Oh, yes. That thing has been recognized nationally. U.S. News Report. Top yes. 20, three years in a row. That That's amazing. Tell it us is, about that it program. It is amazing. So it's actually been the, in the top 10, 10% of school rankings by U.S. News and World Report. We're very proud of that program. But we've continued to expand and improve that program. For example, um, first of all, it's online. And then we visit students wherever they're located, and they're located all around the country. So, I mean, one of our faculty had to go visit a student in Alaska. I was very jealous of her getting to go to Alaska That's cool. for a, to visit the student in the clinical setting. But we've added some things where we bring the students to campus at the end, and they have standardized tests using standardized patients. So... Um, I don't know, this might be more information than you want to know, but, you know, when our faculty go out to visit a student in a clinical setting, what they might, they might visit one student who has a very complex elderly patient who has diabetes, COPD, all kinds of illnesses, and then they go visit another student, and that student only is seeing somebody with an ear infection. Very simple mm -hmm. issue. So by bringing them to town, and we use our simulation center, which we'll, we'll talk We're about. We're going to talk about that, we'll yeah. talk about. And we have people who are trained to act in different, with different symptoms and diseases. But now every student gets tested the same way. And that okay. makes a world of difference to us. So I think, you know, we've written articles on these where we're out at conferences, and that makes a big difference in our rankings, too. So graduate students, they take this thing called the NCLEX exams. Yes. Talk to us about the NCLEX exams, and your students have probably one of the highest uh, success ratios, pass ratios out there. Tell us a little they bit about do. that. They do. We have uh, about 98% of our students pass That's on the big. first try. And you can take it again, yeah. and they certainly, all of them pass, but 98 is very good. The national average of pass rates around the for the country is 86 so the fact that we are at 98 percent year after year after year is very good you would hate to go through a program and then at the end not pass the licensing exam because sure. you can't become an rn it's a big investment both yes. financially and in time yes so we're very we're very proud of that and our faculty go through a lot of effort to make mm -hmm. sure that our students are ready Yep. And your programs, how long is the typical program? So, you, you know, it used to be that they were three years or, or longer. Our program and many programs now, students are in college for two years getting mm -hmm. all the prerequisites, anatomy, physiology, chemistry, mm -hmm. psychology, psychology. Then they enter our program and, and it's 16 months so it goes year round, and so it's four semesters, including summers, and it it's very fast. So does that high concentration, does the student benefit from that? Because there's not a gap. Of, well, let me take the summer off. Yeah, I'm not sure whether they benefit, okay. because we, we believe that there's no, we call it perk time, time mm -hmm. for things to pull together. When I was a student, I got a summer job. So that, as in a hospital, and that gave me extra confidence in the hospital, extra learning so that I was more comfortable when I came back for my senior year. These students don't have that time. It just moves very fast. And part of that was in order to help meet the nursing shortage. We wanted yeah. to get the students out as quickly as possible. Most of them say now that they prefer that because without that, they'd be in school another six months paying rent, having all their costs, and still not having a high-paying job. And you um, you do a lot of other things different. We're going to get to, later on in the program, your dedicated education unit. Yes. Uh, and I want to learn a little bit about that. That's a, a unique, unique way of teaching, a unique way of delivering clinical 
training, and I want to spend some time on that later. But your students that graduate, the other day it was it was kind of we had a great conversation. We were talking mm-hmm. about the students put together a class project, and you know. In my mind, I'm yes. going, oh, well, they do some tests, and it's one of those boring projects. Uh, and you played a video for me. Yes. And yes. that video just resonated, and it was uh, it was great. So let's, uh, we're going to pull it up on the screen here. These are patients. Yes. And they're giving feedback about what now? Right. So these students wanted to do this video showing what compassion is. So they asked patients, how are you feeling today? Mm-hmm. And these are some of the answers that they got from patients. But this was their idea. So four students had this idea, and we weren't sure how it was going to come out. But I will tell you that we showed this video. It's The whole thing is nine minutes. Mm-hmm. We showed it at our commencement, our recognition ceremony, and it was in a big auditorium. And I will tell you, by the end of that video, people, the whole audience was quiet. Sure. Because, I mean, this is why all of us actually went into nursing. Because compassion is important in nursing. So talk to us a little bit about that. You know, a nurse is much more than just a set of scientific skill set. It's You've got to be able to resonate with the patient and, uh, you know, the patient needs to feel like a loved family member. Right. Um, and, and nursing does that better, in my opinion, better than any other profession. As a, as a patient, we see the nurse 80% of the time. The doctor comes in and goes, hey, what's going on? You feeling good? Let me do run a couple tests. But at yes. the end of the day, a patient builds a relationship with the nurse. Talk to us a little bit more about that. Yeah. You know, I, I always uh, think it's hard for um, our students. We're, we're doing a lot in 16 months. First of all, we, I mean, we're asking them to learn a lot of content, um, a lot of facts. We're asking them to apply those facts to their patients. Then we're asking them to learn skills so that while they're talking to their patients, they're also doing things. Perhaps I'm talking to you while I'm giving an injection. I'm talking to you while I'm assessing you. And all of that is overshadowed to some extent by the emotional issues that are going on. Yep. In this video, there's a woman who's dying of brain cancer. I saw that one. And you look at that and you think, Oh, oh my gosh, you know, what's the priorities for her care? Mm -hmm. And of course, her priority is my child. Her 10 month old child. Yes. Who will never know me. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's for a student who, you know, you're in an anatomy and physiology class, there's no emotion there. But in our classes, there's emotion. So now you're trying to learn with all of that. So it's, it's a complex. Situa- situations that we're putting our students through. Yeah. And you spend a lot of time doing clinical <laughs> simulation, and that's, it's not new, but it is unique, and, and you've built this clinical simulation center down on Shadow Lane yes. that is recognized as one of the best in the country, largest west of the Mississippi. That's your creation. Talk to us about well, clinical simulation, and talk to us about what that does through the training process. You know, we are, that that is one of the things that I'm most proud of, of what we have accomplished. This simulation center is shared between UNLV School of Nursing, Nevada State College School of Nursing, and University of Nevada School of Medicine. And because we came together to do this, our simulation center is far better than any one of us could have gotten by themselves. So it's been a wonderful setting. It's been open seven hour, seven years. Yep. It's uh, run with uh, a terrific staff who know what they're doing. I mean, it's been, it's been marvelous. And what's unique, you bring everybody into this multidisciplinary pr- setting. Right. Right out of the gate. So you've got doctors working with nurses, working with technicians. Uh, and that's that's unique because a lot of times a, a, as a student, you're in an environment with other nurses and you don't really get to meet the doctor or right, the future right. doctor. And talk to us about why that's important. So, and, so as we talked about, we're going to work together at, after we graduate. So yeah. we may as well do some things together. We don't have as many uh, joint educational issues, programs that as we should. So for A large part, it's separate, but we have uh, some simulations. For example, we have one where a patient has a cardiac arrest, Uh 
And there's speci- this is actually the picture of it now, if, yep. if we can hold that picture for a minute. So the physician's job during that, it, while it looks chaotic on TV, everybody, when you see these, everyone has a job. So the physician's job is to oversee everything that's happening mm-hmm. so that someone's paying attention to the big picture. And then the nurses are doing CPR. There's usually a respiratory therapist giving uh uh, aerating the patient. There's someone else giving medications. So by being able to do this simulation together, people better learn their jobs. Yeah. One of the unique things, we, we obviously I'm f- familiar with the, the, the simulation yes. center. We did our healthcare 2020 program down there. And from the feedback that we received, that was the best part of that entire program. It, and Yes. What? So just let me interrupt you for a minute. In this picture, you can see the people operating the simulation. So this yeah. is operated behind a closed, uh, behind a dark, where they're in a dark room so the students can't see them. And this is a variety of faculty who have designed the simulation who have come to watch it. But uh, it's really well controlled. I'm sorry, I wanted yeah, to show that with this Yeah, picture. yeah, no, and it's important. And, and I think the part, and I want you to talk about this, we asked after that we did the program, where did you get the greatest learning experience? And our surveys came back. It was from the simulation, but it was the observers and the moment that they got together after, after the simulation and the discussion that went on in that room. And that's debriefing. So after we do a simulation, the students all sit in a room together and they talk about it and we can we video all of this. So we play it back to them. As we play it back to them, and we don't play the whole thing, but we'll pick up parts where the faculty member has noted a few parts that they want to comment uh-huh. on or some issues that are, occur during the simulation. And and uh, the students do say that they learn more during that debriefing than they learn by participating in it. Or, you know, you, you can control um, the amount of information you're giving Students, I'll give you an example. If we cover diabetes this week in class, then the faculty want to assign the patient, patients with diabetes typic- to the students when they go to clinical. Typically, there's no diabetes, no diabetics on the unit that week. You know, <laughs> it always it, works it, out it, that it, way. It, it, yeah, it's strange. Here, we can program one of these mannequins to have diabetes, have all the symptoms, and we can relate it closer. To what they're learning, and these in class. aren't just mannequins. Talk to us about that these because I went down. They do everything. Their lips turn blue. They breathe. They, they it, you know, when we first, give birth. <laughs> when we first got the first one, I was calling it the dummy, and one of the faculty said, "Don't call this a dummy because this dummy is smarter than you are." <laughs> and I think that's absolutely true. So we have a mannequin that gives birth. She gives birth ten times a day or more. She never complains about it. <laughs> we can wrap the cord around the patient. Uh, the baby we yeah. can put the baby in breach you know we can have her hemorrhage we can do all of these things and so in a four-hour period students can have a very quick relevant clinical experience we have a, a child whose lips turn blue and if this st- well he complains of not being able to breathe in this scenario and if the students don't put his head up put oxygen on him, his lips turn blue, and if they if this goes on a little longer, he'll go into seizures. So these mannequins are are just They're not amazing. Dummies. Yeah. <laughs> They're, <laughs> They're not, not dummies. dummies. <laughs> They're not dummies. And the program of them is sophisticated. So we can hire, because we're working together, we can hire people with real expertise in this area to get the maximum out of those mannequins. Yeah. So you're a doctor in terms of Dr. Carolyn Yuha. You've got your PhD. In physiology. That's... Renal physiology. Wow, that's yes. unique. So just ask me anything you want to know about bicarbonate reabsorption by the kidney, and I can tell you. Uh, that's cool, I think. <laughs> Not a topic that comes up. It doesn't come up at many uh, conversations. It's not I, dinner table talk. No, or cocktail party talk. Never comes up. So talk to us... So, You've got a lot of research going on within your building. Yes. Dr. Schneider is doing some pretty cool stuff. Uh, Talk to us about that and talk to us about why research is important to nursing. Well, uh, certainly, um, well, I don't know. Well, let me start with Dr. Schneider's work. Dr. Schneider is uh, an expert in muscle metabolism and muscle injury. 
and muscle injuries occur a lot of time. I mean, they're in athletics, they occur, they occur in, in healthy people who fall, but they're also a big issue in the combat. Sure. And so the Department of Defense is quite interested in this area because what happens is a soldier gets injured and then they get put in a helicopter and transported somewhere. They're stabilized. Then they get put in a plane and transported. Well, every time we transport them, they're um, uh, exposed to hypobaric hypoxia. I'm saying that slowly so that because most people don't use that as re- uh, cocktail party conversation <laughs> either. But um, so this is oxygen levels and the oxygen pressure drops as you get up higher mm-hmm. as your your altitude is higher and that pressure makes a difference in muscle healing so she's looking at ways to overcome the negative effects of the hypobaric hypoxia on patients so that's cool so talk to us how does that research come down to the other student base at, yeah at campus? yeah so i mean that's one example and she's got huge funding for that but you can see that over time this could make a difference in patient care we have other faculty who study far different things they study uh, 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 post-traumatic stress disorder uh, pain and fibromyalgia uh-huh. so we have a variety of 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 research projects going on and this is really um to expand the science of nursing. We can learn much more about how to care for patients by researching areas. There's a big focus now on evidence-based practice. Yeah, we're hearing that more and more. Yes. So, for example, when I first became a nurse, we didn't give anybody who had had a heart attack ice water because we believed that that, as the ice cold water went down their esophagus, it would irritate their heart. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, now there's data that shows that and that it's irrelevant. I mean, by the time the water gets into your esophagus, it's close to room temperature Mm -hmm. anyway. So, you know, we there's things like that that we do and we have done the whole healthcare field because it's tradition, not because we have the scientific base for it. And nurses are positioned to do that kind of research. That's cool. So it's one of the uniquenesses of the UNLV School of Nursing. It is, and that's why the PhD program is important. Got it. So another area, and I just I want to spend time on this because I think this, it makes sense, the dedicated education unit. Right. So nurses, we all in this town, we fight for the clinical space, and we rotate around. Yes. Talk to us about the dedicated education unit and what's unique about that and what are the what are the outcomes that you're seeing from that? Okay, yeah, this has been an exciting program. We've been doing this for about four years and um, at, we started it at Summerlin Hospital because they approached us and said, we want to do something unique. And this whole dedicated education unit uh, started out actually in Australia and then it People in Portland started doing it, and we started reading about it, and we said, let's give this a try. But in this model, the students spend their a, a clinical rotation on a unit paired with a nurse. So here's a, a nurse on this slide with two of our students. And so she will be with them the entire rotation. That mm-hmm. means she learns their names. She knows what they're there to learn. We've oriented her. She knows the objectives of this course. Sure. So she knows what they're there to learn. She knows what she can expect of them. And over the rotation, she's committed to their education in that she, if the more they learn, the more helpful they're going to be to her versus the other model where students are here once and then they disappear and they don't see the same nurse and we have different students from different hospitals on the unit and the nurses don't know what anyone's there to get oriented to each hospital so they probably spend half their time in orientation this is true this is true so we have been wanting and we've done this in other models along the past 12 years we've tried to keep students in the same hospital as much as possible and sometimes you can do that sometimes you can't depending on the availability and the specialties that are offered by that hospital But in this, our students spend three semesters in the same hospital for their medical surgical experience. So at the end of this, 
they know the hospital. Mm-hmm. They know the rules and regulations. They know the electronic health care system. Yeah. That's a, a, another thing that came up. Every, all of our systems in, our, in southern Nevada use different medical record systems. Yeah. So now if the student's going to use it at all, they've got to spend four hours learning to use it. And if they don't use it, then they're going to get out of school not knowing how to yeah. use it. So this is a lot of repetition that's not necessary. And the hospitals benefit because at the end they get to know the student. They're yes. engaged with the student. Talk to us a little bit about what that means from a retention level for the hospitals. Right. right. So one thing is they know which of these students they want. And we tell our students, every day you go to clinical, you consider it an interview. You know, if mm-hmm. you... You know, so you want to be as helpful as possible and as well prepared. But at the end, we've seen some of these, their staff nurses go to this chief nursing officer and say, please hire my student. She's wonderful or he's terrific. I want him to work with us. And so when the student starts their job at that hospital, and particularly if they start their job in that unit that they were a student on, they have a cheerleader already on that unit helping them out, um, interested and committed to their success. So what we've seen, and this is only uh, preliminary data, um, Summerlin over the last year or two hired about 49 of our students. And what they tell me is 47 of them are still working with them. That's amazing retention. It is a very high retention rate. The reten- usually you lose 15 to 20 percent of your staff. Easily, easily. And so to be able to keep, you know, 96 percent or yeah. whatever, you know, is is remarkable, and that makes a big difference to a hospital. That's big. So you're affecting change in a multitude of ways. You've from the clinical simulation to the dedicated education and bringing research into the university. Where do you see nursing going in the next 10 to 20 years? If you were to peek into the future, what's going to change? Well, I mean, one thing that we know is going to change is more people are going to get health care at home. Yeah. I mean, and that has been increasing. And because of the way we offer our education program, and at 16 months, you're trying to jam everything into it. You can't keep adding new information into it. But one thing that we know we have to do is expose students to other environments of, of health care care outside the hospital because most of health care does not occur in the hospital. Mm-hmm. So I th- suspect that we're going to have to give them a, a, some exposure in, in home care. Yep. We give them exposure c- to community health and some school district issues and they're in, in schools and things like that. But we're going to have to figure out a way mm-hmm. to get some of that into the curriculum. Yep. And so UNLV is getting a lot of attention about the new School of Medicine as well. Yes. So yes, how, is. you know, that's something else that's going to change the School of Nursing. How do you see the schools collaborating together? So we've been meeting regularly, certainly with mm-hmm. their leadership and, and talking about some of those issues. Um, without their, uh, you know, of course, we don't have students now in the medical school, but my certainly what we expect to happen is when uh, the University of Nevada Reno School of Nursing mm-hmm. m- withdraw moves back to the north. That our School of Nursing will move into the Simulation Center, and we know yeah. that that's coming. So we're planning for that transition. Um, we really need to do far more interprofessional education and interprofessional research, which should occur as they hire more of their research-focused faculty. Well, this is sad. It's uh, this time has gone quick. The show is coming to an end. So I want to thank uh, Dr. Carolyn Yuha, the dean of the UNLV School of Nursing, for joining us here today. You're very Uh, welcome. Yeah, it's been great having you here. Um, For those of you that watch us every single week, we're going to be on uh, air next Friday at 10 o'clock a.m. Our guests next week are going to be our two chairs of our legislative council. That is George Ross and Charles Perry. And they're going to be talking about what's coming up in the 2017 legislative session, what's going to be happening in health care, and what we're going to be doing to affect change. Education is one of those, but there's going to be many other issues that we'll, we will be talking about. So we encourage you to join us next Friday, 10 o'clock a.m., right here on the VegasVideoNetwork.com slash live. And if you miss that, you could view us online at LasVegasHeels.org. My name is Doug Geinzer, and I appreciate you for joining us today with Inside Medicine. You make it a great day and a great Friday.